Thank you, brother. I feel like we've already had our sermon this morning. I, I really appreciate Bart and other elders coming each morning and, and reading God's Word to us and, uh, and also leading us in a time of prayer for the needs of our, of our body. Uh, before we get started in the actual text of our sermon uh, this morning, a couple more important announcements for you. First of all, um, the stewardship team has been working very, very diligently for the last month or two uh, in preparing our budget for 2017. And so immediately following this service, um, Jim Simpson and the stewardship uh, team will be just giving us a 10-minute um, overview of the budget for 2017. So uh, if you're a member, we ask you to please stick around after the service and we'll just start that up just a few minutes after, after we end. Also, um, next Sunday is Christmas morning and, and we are excited to, uh, for those who are in town to just gather as a, as a family um, and, and to celebrate Christ's birth. Uh, but don't come at 9 o'clock, okay? Come at 10 o'clock. Um, that's, we're not, we're not going to be having ABF this Sunday or the following Sunday on, on New Year's uh, morning. So just come at 10 o'clock uh, for the 1015 service. And um, we really look forward to that. Also, uh, we w- want to really invite you, if you didn't get the email this week that Pastor Travis sent out, please be sure to read on the back of the bulletin today about our new... Um, Rocky Bible Fellowships, our new adult Bible fellowship structure that will be starting up on January the 8th. So they're, they're, the next two weeks, no ABF, but on January 8th, um, we're going to be moving into a, a new format in which we're organizing according to stage of life. So things are going to stay the same for, for children's Sunday schools, but for adults, we'll be having an adult one class, an adult two class, an adult three class. Look at the uh, back here to kind of see where you feel you would fit for the locations. But what we're really hoping for is this will create a, a forum where on Sunday mornings we can really uh, enjoy the Word of God together in deeper fellowship by maintaining throughout the year the same group. We really hope to see uh, greater unity formed within our body through these adult Bible fellowships. We hope to see um, uh, better assimilation for visitors, just to be able to plug right into a group of people that are at a similar stage of life. But most of all, we really hope that this will help us as elders better shepherd our body by having natural relationships with you so that we know how you are. Uh, if, if, if some of you are, are sick or gone, we, we, we know you're, you're not here and can follow up with you. So um, it's our desire, our, our hope is really that everyone in the church will be involved in these ABFs. So if you haven't been coming, um, we know nine o'clock's early for some people, some families, but we really want to encourage everybody in the, bo- in, in the church to come and uh, join us on the 8th at nine o'clock and to plug into one of these, one of these, uh, one of these Bible fellowships, really like flocks. Um, we really look forward to that. So uh, I wanted to make sure that those were highlighted. Um, before we move to our text. And if you're, a, if you're a guest this morning, we are so thankful you're here. We have been going through a sermon series entitled The Big Picture. And you can see that here on, on the front of your, your bulletin. Um, we, we are actually now into part 12. So we've looked at creation and we've looked at the fall and the flood, God's covenant with Abraham um, and God's faithfulness with Joseph. Um, and, and in the Exodus, God, God taking his nation out of captivity in, in Egypt and his establishment of the law at Sinai in which he defined the relationship with his people. And then the tabernacle and, and the temple and how these things point all the way back to God's original intent at Eden for the world and how they point to the end, what we look forward to one day, the, the new heavens and the new earth. And we looked at God's covenant with David in which he promised him an heir and, and, and a son who would rule forever. And we looked at Habakkuk last week, how even through this minor prophet, we see this, this great promise, even when times are tough, that the earth shall be full, full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so now this morning, we're looking at one text in the prophet Isaiah. And as we move forward through the Bible, through the big picture, we see God's plan of redemption unfolding more and more clearly. And I think you'll see that very clearly in this text as we look forward to Christmas next week. But first, let me give you a little bit of a background on Isaiah. Isaiah is a major prophet, often quoted in the New Testament. 
He prophesied in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, who were all kings of Judah. We, we read that in the very first verse of Isaiah. So that was roughly 700 years before Christ's advent. Isaiah announced God's plan of grace and glory for his rebellious people Israel, but also for the entire world. The central theme of the book of Isaiah is God himself. God stands at the very center. It's a God-centered book of prophecy. And Isaiah defines everything in terms of its relationship to God. The meaning of Isaiah's name is simply this. Yahweh is salvation. In other words, God saves. And throughout Isaiah, we see many messianic prophecies. And so we're going to consider one this morning, which Pastor Bart read for us, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. And if you look inside your bulletin, you'll see a, uh, a sheet of notes. They're both sides. So if you are a note taker, there's a few blanks in here that need to be filled out. Um, we, we put this here so that you could also look at it later and, and see some of the supporting references. But I've included this entire text, Isaiah 9, 2 through 7, on the, on the first page. And so I would like to make three basic points um, today from this text. And the first is that God himself is light. Isaiah 9, 2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shown. Now to fully appreciate light, you need to know what it is like to be in the darkness for a time. So let me challenge you right now, just close your eyes, and I can see if you got your eyes closed or not, at least a few in the front. Close your eyes and try to imagine a time maybe when you were lost, maybe you're out in the woods on a camping trip um, or otherwise, but when you were lost in total darkness, when you couldn't see anything. What was it like to be in total darkness? Now, with your eyes closed, imagine a place of total spiritual darkness, a place where nobody has heard about Jesus. So think about what that'd be like. Think cause and effect, a place of darkness. Several of you in this room, I know, have lived in places where there was just total darkness. I, I've, my family and I lived in a place in Central Asia that was the land before Christmas. It was a place of total spiritual darkness. A place like this, the love of Jesus is unknown. Life is dominated by cycles of revenge that has bred culture of violence. It's a place where war is prevalent and it's left people and communities desolate and broken. Society is controlled by religious leaders who don't know grace, but they use religion as a tool for power and control over people. And they oppress the weak. Women are oppressed and considered second-class citizens. And the majority of people live in desperate poverty, simply trying to provide food, water, and shelter for their families. But the saddest thing of all in a place of total darkness is that virtually none of the little girls or boys have even once heard about the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They live in total spiritual darkness. Now, if you haven't already, you can, you can open your eyes. Um, but when you, when you have a place without the presence of Jesus, without that sanctifying presence, there really isn't any hope that, we, that we've already spoken of this morning. There's, there's no light. It's just darkness. And this is what life was like, what I've just described. It is what life was like in Galilee right before the coming of the Messiah. And it, it's also what life is like in a lot of other places in the world today where the gospel has not yet come. In, in these, we talk about unreached people groups. This is what life is like when you don't have a history of, of the gospel influencing your culture. And in these places, believe, and this might be really hard to imagine, but believe it or not, there is no Christmas at all. Imagine that. 
a day in which it's just like any other day when there's no Christmas. And that's what it was like for us six years in Central Asia. We, we get up on Christmas morning and we would celebrate with our family and with our team. But when we went outside, people were just going about their normal business, you know, on the dusty roads, hauling their goods to the, the bazaar on, on, the, on, on donkey carts. Um, no hope, no light in their, in their eyes. There, there was, they, had never, they, they knew nothing of Christmas. If, if they had ever heard of Christmas, which many had not, they, they thought it was a, a pagan holiday in which Christians worshipped trees. No understanding at all of the meaning of Christmas. And that is what it is like when it talks about people walking in darkness. And yet it says, they have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Isaiah's prophecy that light has come to us today, he prophesied this because God has made himself known to us. He's not a God who, who is happy living off on another corner of the universe, just kind of watching from afar. He, does, he wants to be with us, and that is the name of Emmanuel. That's the meaning, God with us. He is light. We know that God created physical light on the very first day of creation. But not only did God make light, the Bible says that God is light. 1 John 1, 5 says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So what does light do? Why do we need, why do we need light? Well, first of all, light shows us the way to go. Have you ever been lost in the darkness? You know, as you had your eyes closed, you were thinking back, you ever been lost in the darkness out in the woods? I have. It's a terrifying feeling to be lost in darkness, not knowing which way to go. Light shows us the way to go. It also shows us the beauty of God. Think about this world with no light. With no light, we wouldn't be able to see the beautiful creation that he's made. We would not be able to enjoy the beauty of God. Light illumines God's creation, and it points us to Him. And if you think about it, without light, there, there really couldn't be any life, at least not as we know it. I know scientists have discovered some kind of a little fish that lives in totally dark places, but life as we know it could not exist without light. Well, God is light. He defines and shows us righteousness, order, peace, and love. He is the one who gives us life and he shows us the way to live. If you've ever been lost in darkness, you know the value of light. So look at verse 3 here. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil. This Verse 3 is addressed directly to God. You is God here. Okay, Isaiah is talking directly to God. And, and he is, he is he's te telling us that God is spreading his light to more and more people, multiplying a remnant to the great multitude of light reflectors, of, of worshipers that we read about at the end of the book in Revelation chapter 7. And that we have today in this, in, in this world is, as we become the fulfillment of this prophecy. Revelation 7, 9, and you'll see this in your, in your notes, says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now their joy is great. And Isaiah compares this joy with farm workers celebrating harvest or, or soldiers after a battle dividing the spoil. Maybe in our culture we could identify a little bit more with a, with a football team. It, the players in the locker room after having won the Super Bowl. What is, what is that, the, the atmosphere? Okay, it's, it's, it's total just joy. And, and that is the rejoicing that comes, according to Isaiah, verse 3, when light penetrates 
the darkness. So Isaiah tells us that God is light, but in verse 4 and 5, he also tells us that God is our liberator. God is liberator. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. So God here is described as a freedom fighter, kind of like Gideon, who broke the power of Midianite oppression with only 300 men. God will defeat all forces of evil, and one day he'll put an end to conflict itself. Tyranny and all the evil things that promote it, you see here in, in, in verse 5, for every boot of the tramping warrior in battle and every bloody garment, those things God is going to destroy. He's going to annihilate as fuel for the fire. God will defeat all these forces of evil and put a final end to conflict itself. Tyranny and all of those evil things that promote it will one day be destroyed in the bonfire of God's grace. And that is part of the messianic prophecy. So today we live in between the already and the not yet. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, but God is, God is light. He is liberator. But this passage also tells us, and it culminates in verse 6 and 7, that God became a child. God is a child. For to, unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. You know, God's power is so far superior, Isaiah says, to all of the evil oppressors in this world that he defeats them by coming to us as a child. And this child is God himself. Notice here in, in the context, this child, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. He'll be a wonderful counselor. He is the ultimate source of wisdom. So let's follow him. He is the, this child that's prophesied here is the mighty God himself, the creator of all, the omnipotent one. So let's hide under the shelter of his wings. He's the everlasting father. What that means here, I believe, isn't, I don't think this is a reference necessarily to God the Father, okay, the first person of the Trinity. I think this is talking about one who loves us with a father's love, a, a leader. So let's enjoy him. He's the prince of peace. He reconciles us while we were still his enemies. So let's welcome him as our Lord. So who is this child that we read about in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7? Kids, who is it? Jesus. Isn't that the stock answer, right? Um, yes, this child is Jesus. You can turn your, your notes of, over. This prophecy here of, of God being, being light, being liberator, and being a child is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And, and just to... to, to uh, if you have any question about that, um, look at verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 9. Look at verse 1. Just if, you, if you're wondering, you know, if you're looking for proof that this is really a messianic prophecy, Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1 says this, introduces this prophecy with this statement. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter, latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of nations. Now, whenever foreign powers invaded Israel, the first area to be struck was Galilee of the nations in northern Israel. So they knew gloom and anguish. 
They knew slavery and despair. And so turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 4 in the New Testament, verses 12 through 17. Matthew 4, 12 through 17. And on my, in my Bible and in the Pew Bible there, that's page 809. Matthew chapter 4, 12 through 17. And this is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Commenting on these verses here of Isaiah chapter 9, Ray Ortland wrote this, This child is the king to end all kings, saving us from our failure, lifting us into his own justice and righteousness. He is Jesus Christ, the Lord, our crucified, risen, reigning, and coming Savior. And he will not come back to tweak this problem and that. He will return with a massive correction of all systemic evil forever. So last night, we were reading this text during our family devotions, and my wife asked me, she said, well, you know, I get all this, but... What does it mean here when it says the government shall be upon his shoulder? And I actually said, let me get back with you on that. So now I'm doing that. I went back, did a little more study. And and, you know, we live between the already and the not yet when it comes to biblical biblical prophecy. Okay, so so Jesus has come. We we celebrate his advent. and, And today he's reigning in the hearts and lives of his people around the world. And we are growing into this great multitude of Revelation 7 as as the gospel penetrates every unreached people group. And the gospel came here and now we're sending it out. It's like, you know, this great network. And, And so, but one day Jesus will return. And at that time, he will judge the wicked and eradicate the curse of sin. And we will live in a in a new heavens and a new earth. Those who are in Christ, where the government is truly on his shoulders and there will be no more corruption and so we look forward to that day that is our blessed hope and so being that this prophecy of Isaiah 9 is specifically talking about Jesus I'd like to remind you of several things and one and you can see this on the, on the, the back page of your notes that Jesus himself is light John chapter 1 verses 1 through 5 introduces the advent of Jesus in this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness but the darkness has not understood it. Jesus, the God-man, the creator of the universe, who became a baby and one of us, is the true light. He came to show us the way to God, to give us a personal relationship with God, something that we call eternal life. That's, that, that's spiritual immortality. He lived a sinless life, He taught us how to know God and how to relate with one another. He healed the sick. He died on the cross for our sins and he rose from the dead. Jesus is the light and he gives true life to all who trust in him. John 8, 12 says this. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The primary, per, primary audience here for that was a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery itself. 
Jesus had just saved her life, and he had saved her soul. So have you been saved? Have you had a personal experience with Jesus Christ in which you bowed your heart? And you said, you are Lord. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I'm trusting in you. Um, I give you my heart. That's, that's what it means. And when you do that, he takes that old heart and he removes that sin and he comes in and, and through his spirit lives in your heart. You become his child, adopted as his child. That's the, the meaning of the gospel. And so we, we live in that grace. We, we live by faith as followers of him daily. Jesus is light. His light is contagious. When we follow him, we reflect his light to the world. Jesus is light, but Jesus is also liberator. Just as God was liberator and prophesied, Jesus himself is liberator. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. So just keep your finger in uh, Isaiah chapter 9. But turn with me to Luke chapter 4 in the New Testament, verse 16 to 21. And in, in my Bible and in the Pew Bible, that's page 859. Starting in verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and that's up north in the region of, of Galilee. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus Christ, the light, is the liberator. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Jesus came to liberate us from our sin. Number three, and this leads to my final point about Jesus. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Savior. In Isaiah 53, we read this prophecy again of, of Christ. Isaiah 53, 3 through 6. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as from one whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Pastor Andrew quoted for us a passage, a well-known passage earlier uh, in, our, in the call to worship, that he who knew no sin was made sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. You know what's incredible? Through faith in Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, not only is our sin taken away, but we are given his righteousness. And so when God looks at us, he sees a, a child in whom he delights. It's not only that he doesn't see the sin, he sees the righteousness of Christ, such that we become the righteousness of God through faith. So let me circle around back to Isaiah 9, verse 1. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. I pray that's your experience, that through faith in him, you have encountered his light. And so Jesus is 
the light of the world. So the question is, how should we then live? How should that make a difference in how you spend this next week? Well, Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. He said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So God is light. Jesus is light. And if we're in Christ as, as Christians, we are God's lights in the world today. So how do we, how should we live as lights? Well, first, be people of grace. People who live in a way that others see a difference. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah 58. As you can see, we're looking all over Isaiah today because there's so much in Isaiah that's relevant to our lives today. Isaiah 58, 6 through 10. And and in this context, God is, is condemning the, the Israelites for uh, adhering to the ceremonial law, but not, true, not, not living uh, true lives of light, not, not living by a true fast, okay? So they were, you know, worried about the externals of being religious, but their hearts were far from God. And so God here describes what true fasting looks like, the kind of fast he looks for and wants, okay? So in, in, in verse 6, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6, is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? Let me read that again. Did you catch that? And to bring the homeless poor into your house. Not just throwing some crumbs. When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noon day. So brothers and sisters, this week, this this week before Christmas, when we remember the incarnation of our of our savior and our lord and our hero jesus don't allow all the busyness of the season and materialism to overwhelm to overwhelm you be people of grace give time and and money and encouragement to others even as you go about your last minute christmas shopping okay Uh, i i don't know about you but i can get pretty intense about this thing okay you know i want to get in and out get it done Um, But as you go, bring encouragement. Shine the light of the gospel. Uh, We still have, we we still have a couple slots, Amanda told me this morning, for for, uh, folks who want to come out on Thursday night to the jail to to bring this light, to be people of grace through song. Just simply going into cells and and singing uh, about Christmas. And so I want to encourage a couple of you more, if, if, if you're interested, to to. Contact Amanda. See her after the service. I think I see you back there, Amanda, waving her hand. Um, there's still a few slots, and we just we need folks who just go. And, and it's such great acoustics and such a great uh, receptive group of people who are missing their families this Christmas, just to bring some of that joy into jail. And we still have in the back. Um, well, I mentioned this last week, and frankly, I took a little bit of flack from some of the kids. I understand why. I mentioned last week that we have Christmas catalogs from Baptist Global Response. And I mentioned instead of uh, a Christmas present, I think I said video games at which my son turned to, 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 turned to, turned to my wife and said, no, <laughs> um, don't do it, don't listen to him. I said, hey, instead of just you know, giving junk, why don't you buy a, a goat? 
for a, 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 a family in Southeast Asia. You know, my, my brother Thomas does a goat project. It's, it's actually part of the ministry that they do in, in training these, these local pastors in Southeast Asia. But one of the things they do to help them have their own livelihood is train them in, uh, how to raise goats. And they provide them a goat. And, and, and so through that Christ, Christmas catalog, if you give $75 as a family to buy a goat for a poor family, it's actually helping a local pastor in Southeast Asia. That's kind of how it works. And so there's this Christmas catalog full of awesome things you can do. You can help put in a well. It is so much better to give than to receive, is it not? Now, kids, I know that's a little hard to hear. Okay, so I want you to think both and. I know something about your parents who are here. Okay, they love you. And most likely they will be impressed by any um, show of generosity you might have to where they're probably not going to like not give you any Christmas presents, okay, because it's all going overseas, all right? So you don't need to worry. In fact, I'll tell you a story. When I was a kid, um, probably second or third grade, uh, I was saving up some money to buy a speedometer for my bike, all right? I thought if I could just have a speedometer for my bike, that will equate happiness, okay? I mean, I'll have it made. Now, how long do you think that brought happiness? A couple days, right? Then you wanted something else. But anyway, really, I was, the problem was it wasn't, Christmas was far off and so was my birthday. So I was having to save up money to buy this speedometer. And um, one Sunday, and I probably, I think, I think it cost like, you know, eight or nine, maybe 10 bucks back then. Uh, and I had saved up maybe about three dollars, three fifty. So that's about a third of the way. And that Sunday, our pastor was, was, was teaching on giving, even on tithing. And I, I realized that I had not given uh, anything, frankly, of my own resources. I was kind of counting on my parents doing it to the Lord. And so the next Sunday, I brought all that 350 and, and gave it, put it in the, in the offering. And my parents were saying, uh, hey, you know, you could just give 10% of that, you know. But I was like, no, nah, I should just, you know, I need to make up for lost time. And so I throw it all in there. And, and you know what? You know what? You know what happened the next week? What do you think? I got a speedometer, right? Now, I'm not saying manipulate your parents' kids by trying to give presents, but both and is a good thing, okay? So the more we give, the often the more we receive, and the Lord blesses. So pick up one of those catalogs, we still have some, uh, kids especially, on your way out of here, and tell your parents that for Christmas you want to help the poor, okay? That is the meaning. That's what it means to be people of grace. That's what Isaiah 58 is talking about, helping the true, the true poor. And yet, they're not just far away. There are folks close to us who don't have much. And as much as you can connect, be people who are givers, who are gracious. Um, be people of grace. Number two, and I am landing the plane here, folks. Don't get nervous. Um, be a part of taking the gospel to the lost this Christmas. Um, how do we love people in places in the world where there is virtually no light? How do we do that? Well, we take the light by moving, them, moving there ourselves. Okay, we've been called to take his light to every place on earth that still lives in the misery of darkness. And so we have the Wild family, and I love having them with us and here. Um, I love to pray with Mike. I also enjoy going out and paddleboarding with Mike. And so I'm kind of sad that they're about to leave. But I'm also really, really glad because they're going to take light back to a place in which it used to be a land without Christmas. Now the church is dawning. And now there are Wano believers deep in this, in this jungle on, on their island of Papua. All right? And, and so God is doing a work there. And yet uh, he uses people like them. We have others in this church right here, right now, this morning, who are praying about possibly going to the unreached to take the light. Now, you guys know when, when you're in dark, dark places, light shines really brightly. And we have a couple candles that are lit right here in the room right now. And you, you wouldn't even notice hardly unless you really, really looked, right? But if we could somehow black out all the, you know, if we could black out all the, all the windows and turn out all the lights and get true darkness in this room, these candles would really shine brightly, wouldn't they? I mean, I remember in Central Asia, where we lived, we often had power outs where the whole city would just, I mean, this happened often, okay? Sometimes it was nightly. 
and we, you'd be without light. It would just go out, and there'd be no light. And so we kept a little flashlight in every room, and we kept little oil lamps and candles. And so, you know, it, for a few seconds, we, you know, tell, assure the kids, don't worry, don't worry, you know, we're good. We grab a flashlight and, and, and then light a little candle or a little kerosene lamp, and a little lamp would illumine a room. And so today, as our society gets a little more dark, don't worry, we get to shine a little bit more brightly, don't we? And, 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 and you missionaries are going to dark places, okay, that we need to throw our weight behind and support. Um, they're, they're like, you, th- you may think, what difference can I make? Okay, one little candle. Well, you can make a huge difference because fire, fire catches. One little candle can, can burn down the city, right? Um, we showed a video, and I know it's a little hard to see right now. We're working on getting, our, our, getting a better projector where you can actually see videos, okay? Um, but, but we showed a video from the IMB at the beginning of the service about a family that, and this family's been at it for over a decade. They are ministering to the Mwani people in northern Mozambique. And this particularly excites me because you got a family up there. It's, a, it's an Islamic people that live on an archipelago of little islands in northern Mozambique. And just 20 years ago, just 20 years ago, there were virtually no, I believe there were about seven Mwani believers in all the world. And they didn't live on the islands. They lived in a city called Pemba. And so I had, the, I had the opportunity before I left Mozambique after serving for a couple of years to get in a boat with another African and another white guy and, and we sailed up the isle, uh, to these islands and visited these little communities. And there were no missionaries working among them, no indigenous church, and they were Muslims, okay? More of a folk Islam, kind of Islam mixed with traditional animism, witchcraft and stuff. And, and so I remember on one of these islands, we, 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 had, our, we had our Lindu who, was, who knew, uh, he didn't actually speak Kimwani, their, their, their dialect, but he spoke Swahili, which they also understood. And so um, we would go in there and just ask them basic questions about how they, how they live, you know, and, and, and nutrition and education. And there was virtually no education on these islands. And then we would ask them if they'd ever heard of a man named Jesus Christ. And even though they were folk Muslims and, and Jesus is a, a, is a, is a uh, valued prophet within Islam, most of them had not heard of Jesus. And I remember one, in one, on one island, we were about to set sail and the tide was, was, was dropping and you had to leave at, at high tide, okay, or the boat would be stuck there on the reef. And so we were getting in, about to push off, and, and there was this fisherman who kind of walked up and I just asked him if he had ever heard of Jesus. And he said, no. And, and, and the guys yelled at me, hey, we've got to go. So I just jumped in the boat and said, well, you know, have a good one, basically. And that troubled me for a long time. Uh, there was no one bringing light to that guy, and I wasn't sure if it would, it would happen, if he'd ever have a chance to hear of Jesus before he, he died. And actually, when I met Beth, we were actually thinking we might go up to that people group, that very people group, the Mwani, and work, work among them. And the Lord redirected our steps to Central Asia. But today, the IMB has got a team reaching the Mwani. And today, just like this prophecy we read about, the gospel is spreading. And so now they they have churches that have been born and they're actually planting other churches among other islands of the Mwani. So that's incredible. That's light spreading. And you can have a part of that right here. And, And we need you to have a part of that by supporting the IMB. Okay, this month is when we do the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We still have a good way to go to meet our goal. So I want to encourage you to to dig deep and to give to Lottie Moon. We have several families from our church that are supported through this. And as a Southern Baptist church, we have an opportunity to band together with, with thousands of other churches to support this great worldwide task. And so today, this is an opportunity that you can have a part in taking the gospel to the lost by giving to missions and specifically giving to Lottie Moon. Last, number three, I want to close with this thought. Remember this, we're talking about light. God is light, Jesus is light, and we are light, and yet we do not generate that light, okay? We cannot generate the light of God. We can only reflect it, and that's what we're supposed to do. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says this, for it is the God who commanded light 
to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, this Christmas, don't get distracted from Christ. Orient your heart and your face towards him so that you can reflect his light. Meditate on the miracle of the incarnation. Talk to him. Confess your sins to him. Pursue your relationship with him. That is the true meaning of Christmas, God with us. Let me close, uh, and uh, as a prayer, I would like to read the words of one of my favorite Christmas songs that reflect some of these themes that uh, we've read about in Isaiah. So just bow your heads with me if you would. I will not try to sing this. O holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, O oh, hear the angel voices, O oh, night divine, the night when Christ was born. Led by the light of faith, serenely beaming, with glowing hearts by his cradle we stand. O'er the world a star is sweetly gleaming. Now come the wise men from the Orient land. The king of kings lays thus in lowly manger in all our trials born to be our friend. He knows our need, our weakness is no stranger. Behold your king before him lowly bend. Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break for the slave is our brother. And in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we. With all our hearts we praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord. Then ever, ever praise we. His power and glory evermore proclaim. May that be true of us this Christmas. Amen.